And so we're just going to, we're going to read Luke 2. We're going to read about 20 verses. We'll stop and chat just a little bit about it, but uh, just use that as a time to recall and rejoice in the Lord. So Luke 2, if you've got a Bible, you can follow along with me. We're just going to start in verse 1. It says, now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, all of the known world, all of the Roman Empire at that time. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to a Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and is with child. Pause there. Let me, just, let me just give you a little bit of background and context and why this is such a significant thing that Luke lays out. You see, uh, at this time, the time in which Mary has uh, conceived the baby Jesus and is ready to give birth, she is engaged to this man named Joseph. And uh, many of you know kind of the, the background and the history of that part of the account. But uh, what you don't know is that Hundreds of years earlier, some 700 years earlier, a prophet in the Old Testament by the name of Micah had told his people that God was going to send a Savior. He was going to send a Messiah. He was going to send one who would save the people from their sins. And he told them that that Savior would be born in the town of Bethlehem. That this small, off-the-beaten-path town would be the place where God was putting on flesh. And so uh, Mary and Joseph are not from Bethlehem. In fact, they're from a far distance away, up in a uh, city in the north known as Nazareth. And so in this, here's what God does. He takes the largest government organization known to mankind, the largest empire that we had seen in human history. The Roman Empire stretched from Europe to India. It was massive. And out of this, they had decided that they should take a census and count all of the inhabitants in the empire, the known world of that day. And God, in his providence, in his sovereignty, orchestrates the movement of people in a way that had never been seen before. And among those people includes this guy named Joseph and his fiance Mary, who go on a journey while she is uh, massively pregnant. Like some of, some of you who... we. <laughs> I don't know, we just didn't, maybe I didn't know, maybe Whitney knew. Uh, we went to Disney World when, we were, when Whitney was like eight plus months pregnant with Clara one time. That sound like a good idea to you? I don't, like I was, we were young and, and it was kind of like this, like let's just get a last vacation in before we have kids. Uh, and it was, you know, you're just, you're doing bathroom breaks every 13 minutes and uh, just hoping like that your insurance would cover like delivering a baby in Florida if that were to happen, right? Like even in modern times and amenities, you know that uh, massively third trimester pregnant is not the time to be like traveling. And here's Joseph with Mary in the first century uh, walking and carrying on a, a small animal, his bride and soon to be son, to Bethlehem. Moving and orchestrating the whole of the Roman Empire God is doing for the sake of fulfilling a prophecy that he had given to his people some 700 years earlier. God bringing all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then it says this, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, this little two-verse segment here, the birth of Jesus, is, uh, I think, the most significant event in all of human history. We talked about that last night, that the word, the divine God put on flesh, be, being made as a man, he came to earth to save us from our sins. One of my favorite passages in all of the scripture, in the book of Philippians, Paul describes it this way, that uh, Jesus existed in the form of God, but he didn't regard this equality with God as a thing to be grasped or exploited. 
but he emptied himself. He took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient. Obedient not just to be born, but obedient to the point of death. The Bible says even death on a cross. For that was the reason that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That the Bible tells us in these two simple verses that all of human history is changed by the coming of Christ. So here's the question, though, uh, in all of this. So what do we do? What do we do to respond to the generosity of God? What do we do to respond to the providence of God working all things together to bring forth a Savior? For us, what are we to make important at Christmas and throughout the rest of our days because of the birth of Jesus? Well, uh, let's look at the example and the reactions of those who were there. Pick up with me in verse 8 and see three things by three different groups of people that we witness in the reaction to the birth of Jesus. Here's the first one. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord This will be a sign you will find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Here's the first interaction following the birth of Jesus is an angel shows up and begins to give message to the shepherds and then from him it says a multitude of the heavenly host a uh, multitude of angels appear and they begin to sing and they begin to praise God and they begin to the, the best word I think to describe it is they begin to worship right the angels in heaven come and worship God and say glory to God in the highest why because Christ has come You you know, if you've been with us on average Sundays over the last few months, you've noticed in the uh, letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians that we've been walking through that one of the things he continues to come back to is that it is not just for humanity that God has worked out his grace and his mercy in this world, but it was that he would display himself among the heavenly hosts. In fact, one of the verses we spent a great deal of time on in Ephesians is Ephesians 3.10. He says, so that the manifold wisdom of God, he's speaking about the mystery of Christ, salvation revealed in the coming of Jesus. He says, so the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That Like the angels, we were meant to be a people who would worship because God is displaying his glory in salvation in Jesus, not only to men, but to the heavenly hosts, that we would praise him, we would worship him, as did they. What's the best response to the birth of Jesus? It's a response in worship. Now, not just in song, not just in praise, but watch the manner of worship that goes forth from those same shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch by their flocks by night. Verse 15, it picks up and it says, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry They found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. Now, here's here's what the shepherds do following this glorious display among the angels. They, They head to Bethlehem and they proclaim Jesus. 
In fact, the most consistent thing I think we see in the New Testament when people come into interaction with Christ is that out of this, they go forth proclaiming him. That uh, Christianity, the idea behind the gospel, is not something that we would uh, even be able to to keep to ourselves, but rather that it would flow from us because it's the greatest news we have ever received. And so the shepherds lead the way in what we are commanded to do, which is to proclaim the good news of Christ. Now, the thing about this is, uh, especially if you've kind of grown up in Christian church and you you know this account, uh, is there is uh, familiarity with this that uh, sometimes masks the oddness of such a reality. See, in the verses leading up to this, what God had done is he had orchestrated the whole of the Roman Empire to move things around in such a way that he would accomplish his will exactly as he had said it to be. And then he follows this up by bringing about God's will in proclaiming his name, not through majestic people, not through uh, fantastic means, but through lowly shepherds. You know, and so sometimes you can just miss it. Like, like I think about in the, the days to come, uh, you guys do family Christmases, and you go to some aunt's house or some uncle's house or somebody's place, and like you walk in, and you ever, you ever experience that just like distinct smell that somebody's house has? And you think, how do they not smell that? Amen. <laughs> don't, you don't have to tell me who it is, right? You don't want to know. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't, uh, maybe you should ask about your house, right? Uh, here's, here's what I think happens. You just, you're just there, right? Like you ever, you ever first walk into a place, you go, that's an odd smell. And then you're there for an hour, you don't notice it anymore right? Like, here's, here's what I think has happened to the Christmas account, in particular, when we think about the shepherds rejoicing in this, is we lose sight of how incredible this is in the history of humanity, because you just know, right? You got the nativity set up, there's shepherds there, there's sheep, that's what happened, but here's the reality. In that society, nobody, nobody was less important than shepherds. It was a job that was given primarily to adolescents, wasn't, wasn't something that would be entrusted to responsible adults because they would move on to bigger and better things. The shepherd were insignificant. They weren't to be listened to. They weren't to be uh, heralded as impressive in any way. And yet this is who God reveals the truth of his son being born to. This is God, who God sends to Mary and Joseph to say, here he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, you proclaim his name, and they wonder about these men of all who hear the good news of Christ and proclaim it. Here's why I think that's so important to us, and, and I never want to miss a chance to point this out, because uh, I think, and, and I want to encourage you to do this in the, the days that follow, because many of you are going to go to extended family, and you're going to interact with people who you are close to, but you know don't know Christ, and you're going to try to interact with them in a way that has a wisdom to tell them about the good news of Jesus, I hope, I pray. And in this, one of the things that I always feel like creates a reservation in us is you feel like, man, I don't know if I know enough. I don't know if I'm a good enough person to do that. I don't know if my life is in order or organized enough in order to tell somebody else about Christ. And like, maybe it'd just be better if I keep my mouth shut and we just find somebody who's a little more righteous, a little more religious, a little more knowledgeable, a little more uh, kind of first this Uh, to tell Aunt Betty or Uncle Jim or whoever it might be about the Lord this Christmas season. And here's here's what the Bible does. It says, no, I sent shepherds. And that's consistent throughout the history of Christianity. It's consistent throughout the history of the Bible. It was consistent in the Old Testament, consistent in the New Testament, that it was not the people that would be most qualified that God sends to do incredible things. Sends this guy named Gideon early on in the book of Judges whose main reservation is, hey, we're like the least of the families and I'm like the least in my family. You can't choose me to go and carry the message of the Lord. God says, well, that's exactly why I'm going to choose you. Right? 
It continues on. God chooses Jeremiah as a prophet who is known as a weeping prophet. He's not an impressive man. David, the city in which Joseph was to be born because he is of the lineage of David, is chosen as a small, runty, shepherd boy. He's picked as the youngest of his sons. In fact, in the anointing of the king, uh, David is not even present. All of his older brothers are. And it takes Samuel the prophet looking at his father and going, hey, don't you have another kid? Oh yeah, I left him in the field. You know what he was doing? He was a shepherd. Because why? Because God doesn't need those who are equipped God doesn't need those who are trained. God doesn't need those who are most impressive to show off their thing. God needs those who are faithful to proclaim him, and he'll do the rest. Even the Apostle Paul, maybe the smartest man in all of modern church history, when he was speaking to the church in Corinth, said, when I came to you, I didn't come with wise words, superiority of speech or wisdom. He said, I declare to know nothing among you All I preached was Christ and him crucified so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God and proclaim him. I pray that as as we go today and the days to come that we would be a people who are wise to proclaim him. But it only happens if this last thing happens. Look at verse 19. It says, Mary treasured all these things pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as they had been told them. Mary leads us in this. She, she treasures Jesus. She treasures what is told about her son. And, and here's what occurred to me that's so incredible about this is Mary is at the cross 33 years later. Imagine what she's doing there. I think she is treasuring these words. That unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. She's treasuring that this, this is Christ the King. Whom the shepherds laud and the angels sing. And so we would haste, haste to bring him, Laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, as we, as we finish this morning in song, as we think about who you are, as we consider the goodness of your salvation, let us be a people who worship you, proclaim you, And in in the depths of our soul that we would treasure you. We treasure the beauty of the gospel. That you, the one who holds the universe together. That you, the almighty God. That you weren't content to be far off. But for our sakes, you came, you entered into this world. You put on flesh so that you might give us peace, salvation. Let us be a people that have faith in that, that treasure that this morning. Guide us as we sing. We pray it in Jesus' name.